We have a new Bible study or book study that's starting next Sunday. Actually, I guess it's starting. Is it starting Wednesday? This one? Okay. So it's starting the following Sunday and the following two following Wednesdays. Uh, on Wednesday, it'll be at 11. On Sundays, it'll be at 10:15. And is there a room? Is it Fellowship Hall? Uh, there's probably a conference room for right now. Stop by and get your books. Uh, this week. Okay, we'll put out an announcement this week where the class will meet. Um, everybody's encouraged to attend. It's a five-week study. The book is $11, so if you haven't um, advised the office that you want to attend, be sure to do that this week or let John know today so that you'll have a book next week. 
We have a school supply drive going on. Y'all know school's about to start. It has started for some lucky kids, but um, it starts officially in Corpus, I believe, on the 12th. We are partnering with Cullen Place School. That's our neighborhood school, so we're doing a school supply drive for them. There's an Amazon wish list, the link's in the weekly email, or you can just bring your supplies and put them in the box here. Uh, we're also taking breakfast over there as a church, I think on the 8th or the 9th, I'm not sure which day. Chris Garcia is heading up that effort, if you'd like to help with that. Uh, we're taking tacos and fruit and stuff like that. We have a church ride rummage sale coming up. This will be in September, but the good news is, is you can start cleaning out your house now and bringing your, um, I said the wrong word last week, bringing your uh, treasured items that you no longer want hanging around your house, um, also known as your junk. You can bring that starting August 25th and you'll take it to the fellowship hall. There's a stage in there and that's where the supplies will be stored. Okay, let me turn my paper here. Um, I had a message or someone talked to me this morning about a volunteer spot that we would like to offer up to somebody that attends a service. Um, as you notice, we have communion every Sunday and we have people, volunteers that rotate setting it up and getting the communion servers and we have an opening. The person that does it, um, that's stepping down did it today so it won't come up, I guess, for what, four or more Sundays? And Connie is your point person who's right here on the front row, and she will train you. It's not difficult. It's just coming in a little bit earlier than the service and setting up and putting it up at the end. So if you'd like to do that, let Connie know. We have a vacation Bible school, uh, I forget what they're calling it, but post-meeting today at 1230. If you help with Bible school, Leslie is anxious to get some feedback on what went right and what went wrong and how we can do it even better next year and meeting today before we forget, um, before next year shows up. Um, I want to announce that we have a new soundboard in place. I think I sound better today. And um, this was able to be purchased with a foundation request that we received. And the gentleman came in this week, installed it. Zach and Jenny spent a whole lot of time up here um, getting it fixed up, checked out with the band. So it, Mike might say more about this or Monty, but um, we're trying things out. So if the same things sound a little off, just make a note and let us know. We're also going to try something a little bit different with the lyrics today. You may or may not notice. You will notice now because I'm telling you. But we're going to put black background with white font and see if that makes it more visible, no graphics. We are getting new projectors. Those are being ordered, and that's gonna make a big difference. But until then, we're gonna try this out. So if you have any feedback after the service, let me know. And last but not least, um, last week I got a little bit of sad news, and I wanna share it, um, but joyful at the same time. Mike Mata, who has been leading our praise band for, I don't know how long now, two and a half years. As a volunteer, I would like to note, he doesn't get paid for this as well as the band. Let me know that he needs to take some time off and, um, and we're going to grant him that time off and we appreciate everything that he's done. He's brought a lot of joy to our worship service. And we wouldn't have been up here without him. So we want to wish Mike well. The good news is um, he is going to continue worship, worshiping here at St. John. So he'll still be here. He just needed some time off from this responsibility. He has children that he's still helping out. He has a full-time job. He has a secular band that he plays in. So he's got his hands full. But we love you and appreciate you, Mike. The good news is, some, sometimes sad things bring joyful things. Maddie, who's also been with us for, I'm assuming, two and a half years. About a year. Oh, a year, okay. And Maddie plays also with my secular band, has accepted the position of our new praise leader. So we're really excited about that. Um, we might try a few little changes here and there, nothing drastic. But we're, we're very blessed to have had Mike and to have him continue worshiping with us and to have Maddie. 
as well as Dorothy and Chris. Yay. So without y'all, we wouldn't even have the worship service that we have. We are looking for, Mommy's, I made a flyer I'm going to put out, but we're looking for guitar players, bass players that would like to join us. Um, Frank is still healing, so keep him in your prayers, and hopefully he'll be returning with the band. But for right now, we're looking for some uh, other guitar players. If that's in your bailiwick of talents, then sign up. And now, without further ado, I'm not handing it over to the praise man, I'm going to hand it over to my buddy and boss, Wayne Carter. Um, good morning, and uh, John, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Uh, this is uh, coming from behalf of the leadership board here at this church, and uh, we're going to have a little conversation here. I, uh, there, there's a, there's a, a quote that I had learned in business that says that your success is largely dependent on the amount of uncomfortable conversations you are willing to have. And I have found that to be very true. I think the difference is, is that sometimes if that uh, subject is about something you love, it becomes a lot easier to have that conversation. And you'll have that conversation regardless of how difficult it is. Am I right? All right. Well, uh, this is going to be one of those. Uh, the... Uh, the thing that's going to make this easier for you to hear is that it involves, for the most of us, a common friend that we all know. In fact, I would venture to say we all are aware of this friend. This friend has been around since 1955, has been through untold hardships, wars, hurricanes, feast, famine, economic downturns, and has still survived. On top of that, in addition to surviving, it has also continued to provide comfort, to teach, to nurture, to love, uplift, and has had impact on literally thousands of people. That friend is actually our church. And our church is as loving and as giving as it's been every once in a while needs something from us and this is our time now over this this uh this period of time since our church has existed this is not the first time that it's needed help there have been many many times over the over the life of this church where there were uh economic downturns uh, uh, Finances that were needed to continue to task and everyone all the congregations that we had at that time rose to the occasion Now in large part we are here and we're still standing today because of those efforts that were made And here we stand on their shoulders Well now it's our turn the leadership board has uh, been discussing ways that uh, we could do a better job of meeting our financial obligations at the end of each month. The, um, what I would like to say first of all is I don't want to alarm anyone. We are actually, given the circumstances throughout society, through the state, through the, through the nation itself, having come through COVID, um, lockdowns, all of this, it's been a difficult time for churches in general. By comparison, we are actually doing fairly good. And we can continue on this way for the unforeseeable future. However, as you all know, that when you take in less than what you spend every month, that is not a sustainable situation. And that's the situation we find ourselves in right now. And we would like to at least get to and this is something that we have discussed, is to a break-even point for the church to help buy us some time where we can do some more things that are more spiritual, spiritual answers as opposed to financial. Um, and by, 
By doing that, what we would like to do is start a program that will start this month or uh, in, in August, that will start in August, and every week what we're going to ask is that people will give something above and beyond what they typically give. Now this will be just for the month of August. Now, to give you an example of what we're talking about, last month, after running the numbers, we were $5,000 in the deficit. After we paid all our bills, salaries, every expense this church has, we were $5,000 in deficit. Sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money. But looking at this closer, what we found was we have a certain amount of people who give on a regular basis to this church through their tithe. And then if you take that number of people and divide it by the 5,000 or divide it into the 5,000, that amounts to only $65. That's $65 not a week, but 65 additional dollars per month will get us to a break even point. We recognize that there are some people that $65 is a lot of money. And we understand that, and we're sensitive to that. If you can't give $65, we would encourage you to give what you can. On the other side of that, there are some people where $65 would be relatively easy. If that's you, please consider prayerfully giving more than that to make, to make, to make up for some of those who can't give as much. Bottom line is, this is something we can all join in together. This is a, a leap of faith for us this coming month to finally, what has been years, that we can actually say that we paid all our bills, we didn't get the hole any deeper than it was, and we are at a break-even point. That will be a real turning point for this church. That has not happened in years. And this is something that we feel like we need as a shot in the arm, if you will. Uh, spiritual motivation, I suppose. To, uh, but more importantly, to exercise our faith. Because faith is more about more than just believing. But it is believing combined with action. And this is what we need from this congregation. And this is what we need right now. So uh, we're going to do this. You're going to hear more about this in the coming days through different uh, through emails and possibly through uh, Sunday school classes, things of that nature. But uh, we would like for you to prayerfully be considering that right now as given an additional amount towards the church. If we do this, if we manage, and we come to a point where we achieve our goal and then some, we will make some noise in this auditorium, okay? We are going to celebrate, and it will not be a secret. Everyone, we're all in this together. This is a, this is a ride we can all take together. This is something we should and could celebrate together. So that's it from the leadership board. This is our challenge to you, and uh, we hope that you will um, look at this as an opportunity and, and, and a way to um, turn the corner in the history of this church and get us back on the right track. Thank you very much. He's coming on the clouds. He the kings will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise for who can stop the lord almighty our god is a lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting a battle
trying to get used to the new format. <laughs> we serve an awesome guy in church. I, uh,
We're going to talk about superheroes again this week, too. But this week, I'm going to tell the big folks about Spider-Man. How did Spider-Man get his superpowers? He got bit by a spider, and he created his character, Spider-Man, right? Because he could climb on walls, and he could shoot spider webs out his wrist and stuff like that. Depends on which version of the movie you watch. But he could do all of these things. But he learned something very important. Y'all remember what his uncle told him? Right before his uncle died. That's it. With great power comes great responsibilities. And we're going to talk about how Jesus was very responsible in the way that he used his power. See, Jesus didn't change or come here to change all the rules and the laws. But what Jesus did do is he came here to redefine those things, saying that it's okay to have dinner or eat with sinners. It's okay to eat certain things that don't make you clean. It's okay to come to church on the Sabbath or on Sunday and pray and heal people and pray over people. That's what Jesus did. And Jesus took a lot of flack with that from the Pharisees. But you see, he told us, he set the path for us that it's okay to do these things. Amen. All right, let's pray. Don't pray. Dear God, thank you for giving me the strength in prayer and faith. Amen. All right, y'all ready to sing? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. All right, Miss Kathy's got your buckets. Let's go around and collect a few coins for our service mission. Last Sunday of the month, that's what we do. The littles go around and they collect some coins for a service mission that they're going to choose. So it may go to uh, Children's Advocacy Center. It may go to uh, something to promote uh, violence or, uh, or for, to help uh, violence or those victims of violence. It, it may, it's whatever they're going to want to, to, to come up with. There's a lot of need. And these, these kids, this is the first step to learning that service. And as we make our way back to our seats, if you have your Bible, pull your Bible out. You know, again, we're going to talk about or continue on with our, our sermon series. I hate to, to call them sermon series because so many times we get hooked up or just, we just wrapped up in all of that. But it is a small series on what makes a hero. Our scripture today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 2, verse 23 through 28. If you're familiar with this, read it along with me in your Bible. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. The Pharisee said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God and ate the bread of the, of the presence which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even on the Sabbath. This is the word of God for the people of God. So we've been looking at what makes a superhero. You know, we, we've kind of tied this in to the death-defying ministry of Jesus Christ. And throughout this whole thing, we've learned what superheroes do, and that is they stand up for what is right 
or they stand up uh, and, and fight injustice. In other words, they, they stand up for what is good and they fight evil. We also learn, like other heroes, Jesus revealed to us what is good. We understand what is good, but the goodness we also understand is, is that Jesus reveals the good and it is rooted in God. It goes way beyond what is pleasing or efficient, doesn't it? That's the goodness that we're called upon to participate in and is the very presence of God when we do this. Well, this week, as I told our small fry down there, that we're going to look at Peter Parker. And as we, we discussed down there, Peter Parker obtained his superhero powers and strength that, in, that transformed him into Spider-Man himself. And he discovered that his superpowers, that with those power, powers, he realized that with great powers, there must be uh, also great responsibility. But Spider-Man, from that saying, was able to develop a keen knowledge and a firm commitment to what was right and wrong. Now, that's what separates us from superheroes, right? You see, superheroes, they're able to distinguish and have a really clear picture what is right and what is wrong. That's because heroes such as Spider-Man have taken an oath, and that oath was or is to protect the world from all evildoers. If you read any comic book, you can see there's always going to be an evildoer in there, and they took that oath to protect the town or the world from those evildoers. But for the rest of us, for the rest of us, what is good and what is right or what is bad or what is evil, sometimes the difference between right and wrong, it's pretty clear. A well-defined line, for example, husbands, it's always right to help around the house. Wives, it's always right to let husbands go play golf. Oh, no, no, comp oh, there's a, there it is. No, 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 don't take that. That is not the gospel according to John. But it's always good to help around the house. It's always good to give a little bit more, a little bit more than 100% when the time comes. And, and my, young, my young ones out there, it's always good to do your homework and to achieve to be the best you can be. It's good to tell the truth. It's good to help a neighbor in need, and so on and so on. And by neighbor, I mean not just the ones that live right next to you, but those in need wherever the need arises. Scripture sometimes presents a very crystal clear of what is right and wrong. For example, in Proverbs 14, 14, it says, right is rewarded and the wrong are punished. But then again, sometimes scripture isn't that clear. It's kind of murky. It's kind of gray in, in certain areas. For example, Matthew's gospel, when God says, uh, or where, where Matthew says that God makes the sun rise on the good and the evil, and that God sends rain on the fields of the righteous and the unrighteous. So my question then for you is doing the right thing always rewarded? Is doing the right thing always rewarded? Or at least rewarded in a way we expect it to or a way that we receive it. As I sat and prepared today's message, I came across a story of a young man who did the right thing even though what he did was technically wrong. It's a story about a fellow named uh, Julio Diaz. He's a social worker and he lives in the Bronx. And he got off the work one night, took the subway home as he did every night. He got off the subway and he was met by a teenager. Now the teenager had a knife and he was waving it in front of his face and said, give me a wallet, give me a wallet, or, or I'm going to cause harm. Well, Julio did just that. He handed his wallet over to him. But as the Young man turned and walked away. Julio called out and said, if you're going to be out here all night robbing people, then you should take my coat. Well, the young man stopped dead in his tracks. He turned around and asked him, why would you do that? Why would you say that? Well, Julio said to him, look, if you're willing to give up your freedom for a few bucks, then you must really need it. All I was going to do was go down to my favorite diner and get a bite to eat. Would you like to join me? And the young man did. Now, by no means am I telling you to go out at 2 o'clock in the morning and confront a stranger 
or anything like that. But what I am saying, in the midst of all of this, Julio had the right to call the police. It was the right thing to do, right? The guy broke the law. He could have called the police and reported him. He could have fought the young man in self-defense. But he chose not to meet violence with violence. And instead, he offered what the kingdom of God was like. He fed and he gave. Amen? Amen. So then, do we... Or so then why do we have rules if doing the right thing is technically wrong? Why is it a law that you're supposed to report all crime? Why is it a law that you're not supposed to help somebody in need by stopping and, and giving them a few bucks? You see, rules are important. Rules keep us safe. Rules ensure equality and promote fairness. That they do. Rules show me they show me where my liberties end and yours begin. Because without rules, it would be very easy to become lost. It would be very easy to become exhausted and reactive. When I was uh, younger, a whole lot younger, when my, I had good knees, knees, when the Lord blessed me with good knees, we, on Saturday, we would meet down in the high school uh, practice field where they practiced football. And we would sit there and play flag football or touch football. But before we got started, what we did is we came up with a set of rules. We would spend 15, 20 minutes discussing where the boundaries were, where the touchdown goals were, what constituted a down. I mean, did, did you touch me with one hand or did you touch me with two hands? Or which flag had to be pulled? Okay? Because I assure you, without that conversation... Before the game would be over, there would be some words said that we did not want our mamas to hear. And there'd probably be some tussling and wrestling around and fist thrown that we did not want our daddies to see. So we set up a set of rules that aren't perfect, and rules never will be. But when rules are set, and those rules breed injustice or abuse, and discrimination, then we have to stop and ask who is making the rules and why are they making them and for what purpose? You know, Jesus gained, uh, himself gained a reputation as a rule breaker, didn't he? He seemingly went along the way, broke a few rules, but Jesus was considered a rebel as well. He was a rebel against the religious domain the governing authorities. In other words, he was a rebel against everything the Pharisees stood for, everything, everything the high courts, the Sadducees, the Hedducees stood for. Because Scripture tells us that Jesus would feed and he would heal on the Sabbath. That's what our Scripture said. That Jesus would heal and he would feed on the Sabbath. Jesus wouldn't wash his hands, wouldn't require anyone to wash their hands. As they went through that grain field, they were dirty. They'd probably been traveling for a few days. Didn't have much water and they were picking grain, eating grain as they went through. Jesus was also a rebel in the fact that he dined with outsiders or outcasts. And he also broke bread with sinners. You see, technically Jesus didn't break any rules. By doing that, what he did was he redefined them. He redefined what the meaning was behind each one of the rules the governing authorities set in place. Early in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus and the disciples, they were going through the field as we talked about in Scripture, and they were picking that grain on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees questioned him why they, why they were permitting such an unlawful act. And I love his response when he said, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? In other words, what Jesus was saying in a very biblical way, he was saying, Have you not really read the scriptures as to why we do these things? And then he throws out there, Humanity was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for humanity. You see, the Sabbath was a gift to us. It's a gift so that we might commune with God and each and every one of us here today. Jesus grounded his position in Scripture. He grounded his position in Scripture and 
in the rule of question, which was the disciples' hunger, that Scripture was to supersede the letter of the law. Again, rules are important. I'm not telling you to disobey rules. You run a red light, you're going to get a ticket. You speed, you're going to get a ticket. You steal something from the store, you're going to get arrested. I'm not telling you to go out to break these rules, but what I am saying is rules are not perfect. So to say Jesus was a rule breaker, well, that's not entirely accurate, is it? Instead of breaking the rule, all Jesus did was redefine the rules. Matthew 5, 18, when Jesus said that the law will not pass away until all is accomplished. You see, it was through Jesus' life, through his death, and through the resurrection that all, that is the all, and that brings the law into completion. When Jesus was born, the process of moving the law from the stone tablets, remember when Moses came down the mountain with the stone tablets and he said, these commandments I give to you, these, these ten commandments, unless you watch Mel Brooks' uh, parody of History of the World Part 1, you know, these 15, and he breaks five, Again, boy, y'all aren't very laughable today. Okay, anyway. Jesus, in in Jesus' birth, the process of moving the law from those commandments, those original ten commandments, he moved those to the heart. He moved it to the heart. Those laws stop and the heart begins. Jesus' life becomes the narrative on what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to live. It's what redefines and re-narrates God's law for us. His death, his death is what brings that law to completion. His resurrection is what everything that Jesus said and did is true. You see, as Christians, we are called to be more than just a rule follower. Yes, there is a right, and yes, there is a wrong, but we are called to something more. We are called to be something greater. We are called to be, you ready? We are called to be Holy. We are called to be holy. Scripture tells us that even the early church faced similar problems as what we face today. They were called to be holy as well. If you read the book of Acts, we see that Paul and Peter went to meet with James, and James was leading the church at that time, and they were talking about, we've got all these Gentiles following Jesus, so what do we do? Do we allow them into this movement that we're going to call Christianity, or do we keep them out? James said yes. Yes, that Gentiles can be offered in. But James also put some stipulations on that. He put some rules on that, and the first rule was this. They must abstain from anything that is polluted by idols. Now, back in the day, people sacrificed grain or meats or food or whatever to idols, gave thanks to an idol for that. And that's where James drew the line. He said, anything that's offered to an idol, they have to abstain from. So let's jump over to the book of Romans, and we'll start in chapter 14, where we see that this controversy started to play out. There are some in the Roman church who were eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And then there are others who were abstaining from eating the meat because they were told or they felt that what was being done, eating that meat that sacrificed idols, was nothing more than uh, sheer blasphemy. So they turned to Paul. Paul was to solve that problem. Paul was to find a resolution between the two sides. Well, Paul could have started off by saying that it's clearly defined in Jerusalem Council that eating meat was wrong. If it sacrificed an idol, then eating meat was wrong. Paul could have absolutely said that. But that's not what he did. Instead, Paul offered a very holy solution. Not a rural solution, but a very holy solution. He said to those that were on the left, it said not to do it. Of course you can eat the meat that has been sacrificed to pagan gods because we know that those idols do not exist. Just because someone of a certain uh, uh, sect uh, sacrificed something to an idol and you didn't believe that, you knew that that idol didn't exist because you knew that there was one God, one God, one God, and uh, through Jesus Christ that there was only one holy God. It was okay to do that. All right? So those on the left... They uh, started cheering and they got excited because they, they were thinking, okay, yeah, we're going to argument. We've been right all this time. But 
Paul said this. However, I hate that word, however. You know, when you say something, in the, but however or yet, if you're eating in the presence for those who this is a stumbling block, if you're eating in the presence of those for who this is a stumbling block, then you must abstain out of Christian charity. What does that mean? What does that mean? Because the friends on the right, they begin to cheer because they think that they've won the argument. So if this is a stumbling block for me, then I need to abstain, whoever's eating the meat, Wade needs to abstain from doing that because it offends me. But Paul wasn't done just yet. He turns to them and he says, by the way, you're abstaining from this meat because you, because you are actually weak in faith. Therefore, you should not pass judgment on those who are eating. Think about that. You're standing up for a certain principle because you just think it's right and you're not going to change because you're weak in faith. If your faith is strong, then you don't pass judgment on someone. I'll use this example because it's something that we, uh, we do all the time. We go out to dinner, we sit, and we have a cocktail or we have a beer or whatever. There's a lot of folks that don't believe that, that if you're a Christian that you should abstain from all drinking. And so, out of respect for that other person, you know, we don't drink around that other person. Because, are we weak in faith? No, not necessarily. But there's nothing wrong with having a cocktail or a beer with a meal. Nothing wrong at all. There's nothing in the Bible that says this is wrong. That's what Paul is talking about. That is what Paul is talking about. Therefore, you do not pass judgment on those who are not eating. Therefore, you do not pass judgment on those who are having a drink with their meal because in your mind you think that's wrong. Because as Christians, as Christians, we are called to be followers. It isn't so much about what is right or wrong, but about continuing the story of God through a holiness of living. It's through a holiness of living. Anytime we pass judgment on an individual for something that they're doing, something that we think is wrong, and we're so easy and quick to point out their sin, we're being self-righteous instead of righteous. Holiness is your calling as a Christian. Righteousness is a path that you follow as a Christian. Yes, brothers and sisters, there is right. Rules help us to understand the boundaries and offer order to our daily life. Yes, brothers and sisters, there is wrong. Sin that leads to oppression. Sin that leads to damaging one's own soul. Sin that leads to injustices somewhere. The breaking of relationships and profit, excuse me, over people. But the gospel... The gospel calls you to an even higher calling than discerning what is right from wrong. You see, we're called to do that which is holy. We are called to do that which is holy so that the eternal life of Christ is shared here, that is shared now, and is shared forever. Jesus is a hero. Jesus is a hero, not because he fights for what is right and resists what is wrong. Because life is not a series of choices between what is right and wrong, rather than it is a life about our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. Jesus came and redefined all those rules and brought them to a completion so that we might be a holy people. There is right and there is wrong. And the resurrection, it reveals that there is also holy. Amen? Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, as these words sit with us, let us remember that we are called to be holy. That we are called to be righteous and not pass judgment on other people. 
Let us remember to pray for those who disagree with us. Let us remember to pray for those who are angry with us. Father, as we continue to move forward, it gets hard from here on out. Because the words that you're saying that I am holy, that we are holy, well, there's always that adversary out there who's going to try to convince us that we're not. There's always those who are going to throw little wrenches or, or darts at us and try to pop the bubble of holiness around us. So give us the strength to go forth to live a life that Christ redefined for us to live a life in relationship with you and with our neighbor. Let us stand up for the injustices that are needed. Let us stand up for those who are hurting. Let us become a pathway for someone who just needs a hand to lean on. There are so many in this world that we walk past and we don't acknowledge because we don't think we should. Let that stop here and now. For the life that we choose is holy, redefined by the resurrection. In Jesus we pray. Gracious Father, we have truly been blessed. We have been blessed in more ways than we can count. So let us give back and return those blessings so that the kingdom that you have placed before us, so that we may go forth and build that kingdom and to grow that kingdom for you. In Jesus we pray. You know, I've been called a lot of things in life. Some of them I don't want to say because there's women present. But I've never been called holy. I've never had the love that I feel right now for my God in heaven. Because he thinks I'm holy. When we break this bread today, it is a remembrance of what Christ did for us. He died for us. He placed himself above everything else to set a path and example of what it's like to be holy. And that's what this is going to represent. It gives each and every one of us an opportunity to come to God today to share in communion with him, to be fed at this table, to be fed by a a, a God that loves us and does nothing more than want the relationship that He started out with Adam and Eve and start out with you. I'm asking you right now today to turn your lives back over to Him. Get rid of all of the things that block us, that keep us from giving ourselves. Keep going. I love it. You got me fired up. <laughs> but I'll stop. Get rid of the things that keep you from humbling yourself to God. Get rid of all the worldly things that hold us back. Spend some time in meditation with God today. Come and be fed and then go home and sit and just listen to what God has to say to you. He's been wanting to talk to you. He's been wanting to ask you some questions. You know what he's been wanting to tell you? Is that Mark, I love you. That is what God's wanting to say. Give Him thanks for everything that He has done. Amen. Jesus came before His disciples that night in a holy 
situation. And he took the loaf of bread and he raised it to the heavens and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given to you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Share my body with you. Become the body. Be one with me through this small piece of bread. Something amazing happened at that point. For he took a cup and he raised it and he gave thanks and he said, this is my blood. The blood of a new covenant. Pour it out for you. Pour it out for you. For many. For the forgiveness of sin. It's that simple. It is that simple. I can't explain how all that works. I can't explain how a piece of bread and dip it into a glass of, of, of juice becomes or makes us one with each other and one with the body of Christ so that we may be one with the world in ministry. But what I can do is we can all bow our heads and pray that the Holy Spirit make these gifts of bread and vine be the body and the blood of Christ so that we are seen by the world that we are now holy, that we have become one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to those helping with communion, please come forward. Brothers and sisters, there's one very, very important thing that I want to pass on. This table is open to all. Doesn't matter if you go to church. Doesn't matter if it's your first time here. Doesn't matter who or what religion you are, what faith tradition you are. The, the table belongs to the hand of God through the sacrifice of His Son who shed His blood for you upon a cross. Even, even if you're still questioning some of those things, this table is definitely set for you today. We do this by intention. We break off a small piece of bread. You'll step to one side or the other. You'll dip it in the, in the cup. And then you'll consume that bread. Will you join me in Holy Communion?
one way that we can become humanly connected as possible is to join in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples so long ago to pray. You'll find it on the screen if you need it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So brothers and sisters, do you feel different? I feel different. Every time I take communion, I feel different. Join me in our closing hymn as the band gets ready to sing us out. But you know what? Before we do that, I just remember, before we do that, you know, we, we talk a whole lot about the things this church is doing and the growth that this church is doing. We had a couple join last week, right? Y'all remember that? We had a couple people join last week. Well, the gardeners asked me today if they could join the church. So I'm going to invite Don and Rick Come on. So we're going to give them the Methodist test. Thank you, Lord. If I can find my glasses. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, that's, that's something when we all read the same, <laughs> when we wear the same, same glasses. All right. So, as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, say, I will. All right. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? If so, say, I will. There you go. First part's down. All right. Your part is going to be right up there. Members of the household of God, I commend Donna and Rick into your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith. Confirm their hope and perfect them in love. God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Let us give him a big St. John's welcome. I was going to say, don't forget, you need to see Miss Kathy afterwards so she can get y'all's picture. Congratulations. Thank y'all so much. A little bit more love for her. There you go. All right, as they make their way back to the seat, let us stand and sing our God. What are you turning away? You open the eyes of the
He's opened the door. Go from here in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace and know that you're loved. Amen. Amen. Don't forget we have a meeting at 3.30 right now. Uh, I'm not sure where she went. She's in the conference room. Oh, she's in the conference room waiting on us. So if you're at that meeting, head on over there.